frenzied provocation and hostilities of the Vietnamese authorities resulted in the grave situation along the Sino-Vietnamese border. There was a limit to China's forbearance. China was forced to strike back. And right back at you, vows Vietnam's Prime Minister to Politburo applause. And they laugh as he says, someone wants to teach Vietnam a lesson, but we'll teach this lesson. And says, tell it to the world. But world diplomacy throws over Cambodia. Sam Van Dong, Defense Minister General Jap, Party Chief Les Wan, had ordered one invasion. Clearly, China was retaliating for his Cambodia defeat a month earlier. Clearly, the street dugout showed that Vietnam expected the invasion. Clearly, the Chinese were to be allowed in. But China didn't, or couldn't, advance very fast. In Langzon, just 10 miles from the border, the casual civilian evacuation lasted several days. Just as casually, troops headed north, most foot slogging into the hills to encircle evacuated towns. Partly this was ancient tactics to avoid entrapment in the now abandoned towns. But mainly Hanoi and Moscow were avoiding, they said, a potential holocaust, which they feel China will again risk if the West continues to equate the two invasions. Clearly, China didn't achieve much this round. That could mean danger ahead. Certainly, as you can hear, we can hear the artillery firing. But it's intermittent, and there are more press and troops on the road at the moment. The press tended to score it even, which means it could escalate even more. History suggests that while Dong Dang, the nearest border town, fell, here on a Hanoi hill called Dong Da, the Vietnamese were celebrating victory over China in 1789. Then, as now, it was really eyeball to eyeball. There was day-long matching of muscle on the battle site and speeches about Chinese defeats in the 13th, 15th and 18th centuries. And now they're told China must also wrestle Russia. So, confidently, they reenact Vietnam's last route of China. This drama of that long-ago Chinese defeat is being presented to an invited diplomatic audience of Soviet and East Europeans who, of course, have more than a musical interest in the current border conflict. It's a beauty and the beast tale, how a lady general rallied popular resistance. History does record the victory, though not the lady. But with the Soviets' reassurance, the finale has 200,000 Chinese running from a wound. Vietnam's mood pre-invasion appears in retrospect significant. Of course, the public needed reprieve after Cambodia. Yet the whole nation, the whole army it seemed, was kept on R&R. &R. And though the Soviets stood out everywhere like security guards, Vietnam had essentially disarmed. So well. While its soldiers played, Vietnam reported ever-increasing Chinese incursions. Foreigners were told during Tet that China had massed 25 divisions, but no one believed it. The atmosphere belied it. In retrospect, Vietnam was avoiding any move. It wasn't fighting from choice, it hadn't been. That was the message. It had been drawn by China into Cambodia and was now to be blooded again. Aware of the coming Tet Offensive, Vietnam assumed a self-punishing, do-nothing policy. Perhaps it was a gesture, perhaps inertia. Perhaps a confused country, traditional prayers, nationalism negating Marxism, young as well as old, adhering to ancestor worship. What motivates them? Traditions or ideology? What ultimate objective? True independence or to be the Cuba of the East? Certainly a puzzle. Prayers at a shrine to those who defeated China. Here, symbolically, a Russian places incense sticks. Yet Moscow and Hanoi held back from war, 
and possibly Washington's pro-Peking policy did more to ignite the invasion. Premier Pham Van Dong foresaw this. Do you at all fear that Sino-U.S. relations, which are improving, might be an encouragement for China to act against Vietnam? We remain highly vigilant. The Vietnamese people, having gone through many trials, are used to being ready to cope with all contingencies. It has been significantly borne out by our history. Noon invasion day. They were indeed used to war. They didn't blink. Each midday in Hanoi, they play the Ho Chi Minh song. This day, there was nothing more martial. No alerts, no blackouts, no curfews. Only a few red banners to proclaim invasion by a billion fellow communists. the pre-invasion mood, what would change? Could they, as the Prime Minister said, cope? Not so well. The invasion had lasted too long for any belief in peace, and peace had been hard enough. A straw hut society which could easily rise from the rubble of the bombing can't so easily rise to peacetime expectations. And here we get some measure of the problems and the pace of things. Hanoi's population has grown by a million. But this complex of 24 apartments will house just 1,900 families and has already taken seven years to build. We're told there are 700 workers on the site, though I've seen perhaps 70 of them. Hanoi has plans, but it is lacking in technical and raw materials. Above all, it is missing the old muscle. Officially, the labor force is, quote, underutilized meaning there's much idleness caused by shortages and confusion. Now, national reconstruction has been further slowed, and the switch from peacetime priorities will be more damaging than anything felt on the battlefield. Here are the debris of a decade of war. Tanks, jeeps, guns, shells, a hundred tons of it dumped here every day. All this hard-hit hardware, acres and acres of it, is now to be reshaped much as it was. This steel reprocessing plant of Buen Hoa is Vietnam's biggest. Now it's mobilizing American hot rods against China. It has switched to war production, quote, indefinitely. Old US war material has fed the plant for four years, and there's still enough, they say, for another four. But now it's swords into swords. An AK is part of everyone's IQ in the north, but not here in Saigon, as everyone calls it. Here, civilians are having to be shown just how a rifle works. How cohesive is the new Vietnam? The new conflict raises serious questions, socially, militarily. Outside the former presidential palace in what's now Ho Chi Minh City, police of the old regime get much needed basic training in sniping and cover tactics. If Vietnam can cope, it will be doubly tough. But today it is still two halves in at least two respects. Here in Saigon, they've modern facilities but lack fighting ability. It's a reverse in the north where the main port, Haiphong, is still in serious disrepair four years after the B-52 bombing, looking in parts as if it had just been bombed. Ships often wait weeks to unload, while cargo piles up chaotically. Some of it, we learned, had been here two months. 
These scenes were filmed well after the invasion. Little evidence that the billion dollars in East Bloc aid is getting through. If fighting resumes, only a massive Soviet airlift could assist Vietnam. That or direct Soviet intervention. That factor and Vietnam's current all-out mobilization may in future deter China. May do. But the result, perhaps intent of China's invasion, has been to push Hanoi into Moscow's arms and so push Asia into a prolonged proxy contest of arms. It seems Peking has exploited Washington's friendship to achieve opposite ends, to harden the battle lines. Vietnam's premier calls U.S. policy inconsistent saying U.S.-Vietnamese diplomatic ties would help stabilize the region. Vietnamese and U.S. talks on normalization had once, not long ago, almost achieved good results. But recently, the United States changed its mind. They speak one way and do otherwise, and show a changing and inconsistent attitude. In this matter, normalization lack of progress is due to the U.S. side. You feel the Cam Cambodian issue has delayed the coming together of the U.S. and Vietnam relations, perhaps for a long, long time? If they want to delay things, that is a pretext for them to do so. Talking for two hours, Pham Van Dong repeatedly told me Vietnam would treasure American friendship. And indeed, stability in Asia and all across our Pacific frontier may depend on the Americans returning to Vietnam as friends. Officially now, it's back to protracted war. In the building where he planned the victory over Saigon, Chief of Staff General Van Tien Zung told me, a week after the invasion, his assessment. <laughs> Their final aim is to conquer our land, but they cannot do it. They should remember the French and U.S. wars. The Chinese army is not as strong an army as that of the U.S. The Chinese have to stay at the level they're at. We are prepared for a long war. Mr. Vice Premier, does China plan to go to war over the Cambodia situation with Vietnam, which is backed by the Soviet Union? Uh, many people have asked me that question. I can tell you all that what we Chinese people say counts. Any action taken by the Chinese is through careful consideration. We will not take any rash action. Whether it be global hegemonism or local hegemonism, China always adopts a firm position a firm attitude. I can at the same time tell you but in addition to attacking Cambodia with great numbers of armed forces in a flagrant way, the Vietnamese are also creating a great number of boundary incidents along the Sino-Vietnamese border, and such border incidents are still further developing. I take it then that the answer is yes, China is prepared to go to war over the Cambodia issue. Our position of supporting Cambodia is firm and unshakable. We 
But as to what measures we will adopt, as to how we shall deal with this problem, we will still study, the, study it. 而这样的问题，不是由我们一个方面来决定。And a question like that is not something to be decided by us alone.